Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I hope you're all having an amazing weekend. I'm still dealing with my plague, but we do have some excellent news that we're going to be discussing, the first of which concerns AMD. Well, actually, we have several pieces of AMD news, but this first one is mobility parts based on the RDNA architecture. And there are two parts which have had both some of their specifications anyway, as well as performance targets leaked. So the 5500M is the top dog and has 1408 cores, GDDR6 memory with a clock frequency of 14 Gbps. Unfortunately, normally it would be pretty simple to ascertain memory bandwidth, but given we don't have the memory bus width, it's impossible to obviously gauge that accurately, and we also do not have the capacity of memory either. And we also have the RX 5300. As you could probably guess, these GPUs are aiming to take out the uh, NVIDIA Turing line of lower-end GPUs. So, what about performance? Well, there has been a benchmark, assuming it is authentic, it has been provided to WCCF Tech. Well, you can see yourself one of the issues immediately with this benchmark. Um, all of the numbers are essentially rounded up or down, it's hard to tell. So, for example, if you look at the uh, GTX 1660 Ti, it scores 14,000 points, and the RX 5500M scores 13,000 points. Now, for example, you could also look at the 1660 TIMQ and say to yourself, well, that scores 12,000 points, and the 5500M scores 13,000 points, but obviously, depending upon the configuration of the laptop, the environment that it's in, what thermal uh, constraints you've got, what you decide to do with the fans, you know the drill by now, so I'm not going to go into the whole spiel, but all of that stuff plays a rather key role in what's happening with the um, score, what's happening with the core clocks. So you could look at the 5500M and it could score 13,001, whereas the 1660 Ti laptop could score 12,900 and 97. Now, obviously, there's probably a bigger gap than that, but my point is that uh, these GPUs with these scores, you can only get rough performance targets and you can't get anything uh, super duper accurate. According to this information, however, it makes a lot of sense that uh, AMD are releasing this because essentially it's going to be an all in one solution for laptop vendors. So, they could pair this with a Ryzen 7 CPU, and obviously they've got the GPU right there. And then, conceivably, you could have a laptop which would cost you around a thousand bucks-ish, and you would have a, a GPU in there which is more than capable of playing like pretty much any game at 1080p without any real issue. Uh, GTX 1660 slash 1660 Ti is more than capable of playing pretty much any title with all of the quality settings at their highest at 1080p. Now we're going to move over to a piece of news that has been doing the rounds over the past few days, but I was kind of waiting for a official statement from AMD regarding this, and that is the price increased for certain Ryzen CPUs. In other words, the Ryzen 3000, the 3900X, is particularly noticeable with its pricing. Now, just as a quick reminder, these CPUs uh, debuted on the 7th of July and had a MSRP of around 500 US dollars. I say around because obviously based upon your region and taxes and all that stuff, it's going to differ. But now, you are looking at around 570 US dollars for this very same CPU. So, it's had a, a percentage increase of around 15%. Uh, Tom'sHardware.com have done a really good due diligence with this, and they've done an article as well. I'll link it, of course, in the description of this video. So, Newegg, the percentage uh, of price increase is around 16.2%. Amazon and Micro Center is around 14%. B&H Photo and Video, I'm unfamiliar with that retailer, to be honest, so I'm assuming they're pretty well known in the States. That's 6%, but Best Buy, you can still get it for the uh, original price of 500 bucks. 
So some people were wondering, well, are AMD doing a sneaky? Are they unofficially raising the price? And the answer is no. It is retailers. This is a simple supply and demand issue, i.e. Supply of the 3900X is quite low, as we've discussed several times before. So, obviously, uh, retailers are price gouging. And this is no different to what's happened with Intel. And we've seen Intel get really hit with that, with especially given that they've had issues with uh, shortages on the 14NM manufacturing process, although that's somewhat being alleviated-ish. Uh, obviously, uh, we saw it even worse with the... Uh, GPU mining craze, I swear, every time I even think about the GPU mining craze, I just feel uh, terrified, and it feels like it's going to come back to haunt me. But anyway, yeah, uh, so this is not AMD's issue. My advice to you would just be to keep looking at retailers, and, well, yeah, I mean, prices on eBay, particularly if you get a pretty uh, highly clocked CPU, they can be kind of ridiculous. We've seen them go for seven, eight hundred US dollars for the thirteen nine hundred, which is absolutely bonkers. Oh, and one small last final piece of news for AMD anyway, and this concerns the thirty nine fifty X. So as we all know, the uh, CPU is not going to debut until November, and this will be alongside the new third generation of Fred Ripper processors, but. There is a new OPN, which is order numbering part, um, which has been spotted for a 3950X. And so the reason that this is quite interesting is because it's potentially possible that we will see the CPU available without the stock cooler. So this would mean that you could get the CPU only and you would not get the Wraith Prism cooler. Now honestly, the Prism cooler is not bad. It's a pretty damn good cooler. But I think for people who are buying a processor like this, there's also a very good chance that you are going to have a very high-end AIO, AIO, if I can speak, or you potentially would have a custom water cooling loop or whatever. Uh, let me know in the comments below. Would this be something you would do, use the stock cooler, or would you have your own custom cooling solution? Hopefully, this would mean that you could save some pennies on the processor, It'll be interesting to see what the price difference between the with stock cooler versus non-stock cooler version would be. Hopefully it would be at least, you know, a few pennies saved. Uh, but yeah, in the final piece of news, we're going to be discussing Intel. And this is actually GPU related, well, iGPU technically, with the Generation 12 GPU. We actually have an entry on CompuBench. As many of you know, CompuBench is not necessarily the best benchmark in the world, but it does provide us some kind of comparison, particularly between generations. And the other thing as well is we can get some understanding of what Intel are doing with Generation 12. If you are unfamiliar with Generation 12, you can check out my uh, Intel XE video where I do kind of touch on Generation 12. But also another important update, and this was kind of accidentally confirmed by an Intel employee uh, um, when they were discussing the development of the drivers for the 12th generation, and they've basically said it's the biggest change in architecture. Um, it's basically gone under extensive reworks of design. So it's, yeah, we know that they are definitely changing some stuff under the hood. But anyway, there is an unidentified Generation 12 iGPU which has been spotted on CompuBench. One of the really interesting things about this is the number of execution units. So the Iris Pro P580, which is the highest end SKU we know of for an iGPU from Intel, contains 72 execution units. And also a number of uh, CPUs that now also contain iGPUs with 64 execution units. But if you compare this to Generation 12's iGPU, we see a staggering 96 execution units, which is pretty damn impressive. Now, obviously, this is still an engineering sample processor, so we are probably looking at a CPU which is not necessarily finished, and there is still room left in the tank for performance to improve, and not just on the hardware side, of course, but the, the actual drivers as well. This particular part is clocked at 1.1 gigahertz. 
So it's going to be interesting to see whether those are final clocks or whether there's room left in the tank. Generation 12 is also significant because it's the same architecture which will be found in the discrete GPUs from Intel, which of course are scheduled to launch next year, known as XE. So Generation 12 and XE are the same thing. Generation 11 is kind of like, yeah, the interim architecture. On CompuBench, you can check out a result of the i5-1035G7, uh, which is an Iris Plus graphics, and at the moment, this particular architecture is scoring roughly on par with the uh, 1035G7, or significantly faster, depending upon the application. So, for example, in local tonal mapping and ocean surface simulation, well, there's not really any contest at all. Whereas, on the other hand, something like level set segmentation, uh, 128, there's no real difference. You could almost say that that's margin of error. So it's going to be fascinating to see what happens here. So with the Generation 11 parts, Iris Plus, they have around one teraflop of FP32 performance. So um, we have 64 execution units for that particular generation with the highest end part. And each execution unit can, uh, uh, can execute 16 FP32 per clock or... 32 FP16 operations per clock, that's half precision. And each execution unit uh, houses two ALUs. So this basically means that you have two ALUs times uh, SIMD4 uh, times two operations for FP32. And each of the execution units are multi-threading. So what you can basically do for a very easy math with the 11th generation is you can say 64 execution units times 16 instructions and then you times that by the clock frequency. So in this case it was 64 times 16 times 1100 and that provided you 1.1 teraflops of peak FP32 performance. Assuming that the architecture in that way it remains consistent, this means it's going to be about 1.7 teraflops for the next generation GPU, but for all we know, and I'm going to make a guess here, that there are some significant differences in how the execution units function for generation 12, but unfortunately I don't have that information to really confirm that, but if it's the same type of um, basic layout, it's got around 1.7 teraflops of FP32 performance, and also this is based upon this particular sample, and of course we don't know whether the clock frequencies are final. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'm going to get going because my voice is not very happy with me, unfortunately. But I will hopefully see you all soon. I hope you have an amazing rest of the weekend. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.